This is the third architecture meeting that we've had. I, second, first have been over pretty much the same stuff. This one in particular, I want to show um, the actual RabbitMQ uh, server running locally and show you how I'm connecting one microservice and uh, having it communicate across RabbitMQ with Mass Transit over to the next uh, microservice to be to be consumed. So uh, basically, the problem that I'm trying to to get around is I have this this microservice right here. So let me expand that. Um, so this this houses my front end, and if you saw my I think my past video, uh, I separated my front end from uh, the back end, and the back end is going to be composed of several different microservices. This one in particular, you can see it has the uh, Docker compose file. Um, and this has my, my front end, which is a React front end. However, uh, I'm going to show you something. Uh, this is the next problem I have to solve. You'll see. So I'm just going to hit play, and it's going to run my Docker Compose. Um, it's uh, Docker Compose up, and it's going to start everything I need. Uh, should be, unless it's going to give me a, a timeout. It might give me... Uh, did it give me a timeout? I don't think. Docker started. Okay, so I should be all set. So if I actually navigate to um, Docker Desktop, and let me drag that in view, you can see my Compose file with my two uh, containers running. So we'll go to the uh, local instance of RabbitMQ, and I'm going to go ahead and sign in. And this is, here we go, this is my RabbitMQ uh, message broker. So this is again running localhost port 15672. Uh, you can see that I have one, um, let me go to exchange, engine models, and here it is. And you can see that I have in fact um, one queue and I have two messages ready, ready to be um, consumed by my engine API. So basically how this works is if we minimize all this stuff, this is my main application. This is the entry point to my application. So this is going to have the front end. So this is going to have, uh, it's a front end for back end pattern. And this controller, home controller, currently I just have a couple routes set up just for really testing. Um, but everything is going to be routed through uh, this back end controller. And if I call this endpoint here, you can see that I have it publishing my message uh, to my bus, and it's it's sending this engine model, and it's going to return back a 200 code. So if we actually go to um, where this is, um, okay. So this is the front end again. I having some some React front end issues or something. I think I might have to rebuild the image, um, and I might have to modify my Docker file. But uh, pretend that there's a front end here. It's running. It just there's there's something going on. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and go to that route that I found there. Um, I don't think I have a breakpoint set on there. No. Let's go ahead and set a breakpoint to show you that it's running, and we'll go ahead and hit that, and you can see it. Let's call my breakpoint. So it's going to post it to the message bus, and it's going to turn back as a 200 uh, status. And if we go back to my RabbitMQ uh, server, you can see that I have some more messages in the queue, which is really awesome. Um, but they haven't been consumed yet because my engine API isn't isn't alive yet, isn't isn't running. Um, because it's a separate uh, separate microservice and I don't have it part of my Docker Compose file yet. So if we go to my engines API, you'll see that I have a um, consumers folder and the consumer is getting, uh, is basically going to um, read those messages essentially in the queue. And how this works is that if you go to the program CS file, uh, you can see that I have registered um, this class as my consumer and it's connecting to the same rabbit mq local uh, server as my other one and if you go to my main uh, front-end application you can see that I have the same connection right there 
Um, there's some con there's some configuration you have to do a little differently if you're running them inside. Uh, a, a, if, if you're using Docker to run them inside a container, you have to change the host name. Uh, I, I still might go back to this because I was running into um, a couple problems with this. Originally, I left it as localhost, and then it wasn't. It, it's like it wasn't finding the right. Um, it, it wasn't finding to finding the URL or finding the path to to RabbitMQ. Uh, kind of weird. So there's I, again, I have a lot of open questions that I still need answered about message brokers and RabbitMQ and and working with it. But that's the entire goal of this project. So uh, so this is what we're working with now. Uh, after reading some things, people said to use uh, this when you're using um, a, a Docker image. So that's what I did, and it worked. So uh, again, so let me to illustrate this. I have five messages ready to be uh, consumed by my API. So if we go back to my engines API, and I'm I'm just going to start this again. This is not I don't have this containerized yet in Docker. So I'm just going to start this like you would a typical thing. You can see immediately in the console, you're going to see uh, some console statements here. So one, two, three, four, five. You can see five printouts of an engine, engine model. And where those came from is the queue. So if I go to my uh, engines controller, uh, I have to figure out where. Um, uh, let me go back to here. Okay, so this, this consumer file is has the namespace uh, two stroke engines dot consumers. And if we go to, um, or sorry, the thing I want to be looking at is you can see this class is engine is public class, you know, name whatever you want, inherits from I consumer. And then you pass in this type, right? So engine model. So if we go to engine model, you can see that it's basically just a uh, object based on my, based off of my, right now, which is based off my, um, my database table that's probably subject to change i might change that but if we go to um if we go here you can look at the namespace you can see the namespace is uh looks a little bit different from what you would expect to see um for this project because the solution is engines api so you would think that it would be engines api dot uh models dot whatever um, but it's not. And the reason for that is because I had this question of, okay, you know, I have this RabbitMQ uh, server running locally. I have two, if I, you know, if I have two microservices running independently of each other, contained in different solutions, how do those, how, how can you register a consumer to consume an object from another uh, solution? And I guess the answer evidently is you have to make sure that, you know, the, the objects match, but also you have to have the same namespace. Because if we go into RabbitMQ and we go to our exchanges, you can see that uh, the namespace is right here, two shark engines, models, model objects. So that is the namespace. So it has to be the same class name and namespace. So that threw me off for a while. Um, but now if we go back to our overview uh, or queues, sorry, you can see that they, we have successfully consumed those five messages, which adds, which uh, lines up exactly with what we see in my console logs here. So the consumer class is, is, is we've registered that in our middleware pipeline here, right? So add mass transit, add consumer. So this consumer is registered and it's going to receive whatever we send to the queue. So this consumer all we ha it's not doing anything, but it just has this consume method. Um, I think you can make this asynchronous, but I just have it returning a task completed. But again, this is just basically test code until I actually, uh, you know, create the business logic for all these microservices. But the the connection is there, so I'm logging um, or I'm, I'm writing to the uh, debug uh, window my message, and the message coming off of the queue. Uh, is the engine model that's passed from the context. So it's super powerful. So immediately you have, uh, I have a scenario where I can, um, let me let me call this for my front end. So if I call that, that route again, uh, again, it's, oh, I need to take the breakpoint off. Let me, uh, let me just, okay, 
<laughs> let me call it a couple times. Uh, so again, this is one microservice to the other. So if I go back to my engines API it, that, that's running and is ready to receive messages or consume messages from the queue, you can see that I have successfully just consumed all of those in real time. So I can do whatever I want with that. And so now I have a successful um, multi-container, or sorry, multi-microservice uh, communication here. So I have, I, and they're completely decoupled. The only coupling that that is 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 there uh, is not even really coupling. It's just kind of like a you know something that has to be the same. Is this? So the exchange is given your namespace and your class name. So you just have to make sure that whatever is consuming um, that that object has that that same namespace um, and class name. And so that that's the only weirdness, right? You have to you have to line those up. Um, and for me, the reason I don't want these these microservices running in the same solution that way you can share packages and everything like that is because I don't want them tightly coupled like that. I don't want to be I, and I want them to be independently deployable. I don't want them to share the same repository. Um, I don't want them to share anything. Ideally, you know, one my, my two stroke engines microservice should not care at all what my engine's API microservice is. It shouldn't have any knowledge of, of this microservice because that's not, that's not, you don't want that. Like, cause it, you, you, you could argue that, oh, why don't you just have your front end, you know, call directly into that microservice and, and, you know, vice versa, whatever. It's because then once you do that, you, you've, you've created this scenario where you are dependent now on um, a service and it might break with, with future implementations. Um, whereas a message broker provides you flexibility as you can just register microservices to be consumers of something that your front end sending up to it. So it really you can just add in additional microservices at, register them as consumers of this object. So if you need to add additional functionality, you can do that and it doesn't, uh, you know, no, no, nothing happens. It doesn't break anything as well as the, um, it prevents against loss of messages, loss of exchanges, right? So if you if you were to just couple my my front end to my one of my back end microservices, and I post a message to that, but let's say my my back end service is down for whatever reason, I have like a five second downtime. All those messages that were sent there have now just vanished, right? Nothing happens to them. Whereas a message broker. Uh, it, since they're in a queue, it's not going to, it's not, if, if that service, just like we saw, isn't running, it's not going to send those messages and have them lost. It's going to, it's going to house them in the queue until that service is running. And then it's going to send them, uh, to that, to be consumed successfully. So that's the advantage you get here. And you can see how that's going to increase availability and it's highly scalable. Uh, so I can scale one microservice independently of the other. I can write a microservice in whatever language I want to, because Obviously, for this, I'm just using .NET uh, as or you know C sharp. But I, if I want to make one in Python and Rust, whatever I, you know, whatever I want, I should be able to do that. So approaching it from this way early on uh, will provide us that flexibility. Now we got to do a lot of configuration and everything like that, and I have to fully wire up this this message broker system. Um, but you can see, you know. You can see the hopefully you can see the advantages and hopefully the the example illustrated that. So I, I know it looks like a lot, especially like a lot of overhead, because um, you're like, oh, you know, you have to remember to start up, you know, uh, service X Y Z in order to do that, uh, and that's that's where Docker Compose comes into play. It's it'll orchestrate all your containers for you and right now this is like a work in progress here so right now i'm saying hey start up my two shark engines um container start up the rabbit mq uh container and then i'll need to add in um the engines api container once i've added the docker support for that so once i do that um i should be able to publish my uh engines api image to to uh some whatever whichever uh 
uh, registry I, I choose, and then I should be able to launch that uh, whenever I need it. So you should be able to just come into the, your main um, solution here and just hit run, and it should uh, it should um, add everything for you. And then you can add a depend like a depends on statement here to make sure that things start um, in the order you want them to. So there's a lot of power with this. Uh, obviously, it's 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 up enough to get me at least experimenting and prototyping. Um, and then Docker Desktop is, just kind of gives you that advantage of giving you the UI to interact with all the Docker stuff, which is nice. And then you can see what's running, and you can see uh, what your containers are doing. Um, you can delete your... Uh, I don't know if... You, I'm sure you can delete the images from from here. I don't know. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff i got to figure out still on how I'm... How I'm fully going to do this, um, but just having this flexibility of, of how loosely coupled these are now is is really huge, and it gives you it gives you a high degree of availability because you don't lose messages, and that's really the uh, that's really the biggest thing for this. Um, the next thing I'm I'm going to be adding uh, to this project, oh, I say project, I mean this whole orchestrated system. <laughs> is an API gateway. Um, I'm still running into issues with, um, because I'm not throttling the requests to the back end, I'm still running into um, some timeout issues. I don't really want to increase the timeout, so I, I'm already going to be adding an API gateway anyway, but I think I'm just going to configure that to some kind of predefined rate, um, uh, you know, number for rate limiting um, to help me uh, alleviate that i don't know how much i'll i don't know what the number is i still got to experiment with that but we're for sure going to be adding an api gateway the api gateway is going to be its own microservice too so that'll that'll have to be added to my docker compose file but once i have the api gateway set up um that'd be really nice because then i don't have to know uh any routes to um the, the front end doesn't have to know like specific routes to um, any of the back end, back end microservices or anything like that. So it's just going to need to know the route to the API gateway. So that way I have just one singular spot where I can change those routes. Um, advantages to an API gateway, you get, you can, you get that singular spot where you can handle all your routing. Uh, you can, you can set up a uh, rate limiting. Uh, so obviously, you know, th throttling your, your, how many requests you're sending at a time. Uh, there's some other ones. Obviously, you can scale the API gateway independently of your application uh, or of other um, services. Uh, some disadvantages people always point out is that you've now technically introduced like one area for failure, um, which is which is true uh, a little bit, but we should be able to get around that in, for, as far as like um, using health checks and also uh, duplicated services. So we should be fine. An API gateway is pretty pretty standard practice. So I'm going to be using Oscillate API gateway just to host it locally. Again, I'm trying to do everything locally because it's, it's free, but it also it's Oscillate. Oscillate's a really good option. Uh, as well as RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ is a really robust option, but it's, it's, it's free. It's open source, which is super nice for me because I don't have to go through like uh, some kind of cloud provider's message broker which again costs money and i don't i don't want to not i don't i don't need that i can if i can deploy everything myself and get it, get it all set up in a single docker compose file it's tough to beat so i think i'm going to do that and that should take us into um like next week i would think um as far as work but we'll see we'll see what the new year brings and we'll see how much time uh, I go with all this stuff. So anyway, thank you all for watching and hope this was, uh, helpful, entertaining. Let me know. All right. I'll see you.